It's not uncommon during a chase season to drive, say, between 10 and, and 20,000 miles and just in the Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is special because it is within this area that the ingredients which can cause a tornado come together most often. And of course, the western portions of the alley, the, the area I call the hot zone, is unique because of the landscape. Unlike the eastern portions, it's flat and you can see forever. And of course, if you're a chaser, that's important for two reasons. One is you can see tornadoes and chase them. And the second for me is because you can photograph them without the trees and the hills that you have in the eastern areas. There is a special beauty to the plains that most people, I think, miss, and, and that can be something very subtle. The, the little towns that you drive through that look like they haven't changed in, in 50 years. You have what look like oceans, uh, flowing green oceans of wheat fields, and when you contrast these beautiful white clouds with these, it's, 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 the contrast, at least for me as a photographer, is, is amazing. Sometimes it's mind-boggling, and it's, it's ever-changing. That's one of the things I like about it, too. You, you never have two days where the clouds are the same or the, or the landscapes are the same. It's, it's sometimes just, just breathtakingly beautiful. Well, a successful chase day to me is not always uh, landing the ultimate tornado or the ultimate lightning bolt or the ultimate storm cloud. Uh, that generally doesn't happen. Uh, it's all the little things you see, the people you meet, uh, the little towns you drive through. Uh, all these things, no matter how many times you see them, is really what makes up chasing. And you meet other chasers along the way and you, cha you, you share stories. Uh, these are the things I cherish. It's not just the storm clouds. It's not just the uh, ultimate tornado shot. Uh, it's the interaction with other chasers. It's the people, again, you meet. Uh, so many characters uh, that'll come up to you in a little restaurant and tell you a story about the tornado that passed, you know, in 1942. And, and these are the things that make up chasing. The people, uh, the places, the sights, the smells, the sounds uh, that you experience. It's not just the storms because you're not going to have storms every day. Well, I remember two or three days in advance of the storm day, people were telling me this was going to be the big day. Even that day, the forecast that was being issued said the possibility of large and damaging tornadoes. And that does not happen very often, where you have something that indicates that kind of severe weather may occur. This is a potentially dangerous weather situation for much of Oklahoma. Extreme instability and the expected winds aloft indicate the potential for a significant severe weather outbreak later today, including the possibility of very once the storms go up, you have to rely on visual experience. Probably the, the number one thing that chasers look for are when the first towers go up, these, these solid white cloud masses. You want to see the structure. You, are, are they leaning in the right direction? How are they structured? Are, are they very solid? Are they frayed? Are they, are they very mushy? Uh, and that sounds kind of funny, but that's very important because an experienced chaser can tell from those towers alone what a storm is likely to do if it forms and, and, and if it will be severe in nature. First towers went up about an hour and a half ago. This is the first one I can see that has some real structure to it. 636, very large tornado still on the ground. This was the first tornado that I actually photographed, that I actually had on videotape or film. I had seen tornadoes before, but either from a distance or they weren't in a position where I could photograph them. So this was unique because this was the first up close personal tornado opportunity I'd ever had. Tornado is now wedge, large wedge on the ground, very large vortex. The thing that amazed me about this storm was the tornado was so big, and I believe this thing was almost a mile wide at one point. We're going to have to stop here. It's going to be crossing the road. I mean, if you go back and look at the videotape, it almost looks like a, a cloud of smoke on the ground. It doesn't look like your typical funnel that, that we all associate with a tornado. It was so big, it looked like smoke. And I, I can imagine somebody at a distance looking at this would never have figured this was a tornado. They would have thought that it's a dust cloud or something like that. Chasers, of course, is going crazy over the gigantic wedge. All right, less than a mile down the street now. Okay, it's going to be crossing the road now. several supercells that day which produced a very very violent tornadoes the one I saw if I remember right didn't kill anyone which was very fortunate considering the size of the tornado of course the one in Wichita killed many people 
but that's one of the things when you chase. You never know of where that tornado is going to go. I mean, I've sat and looked at maps and tried to plot a course of a tornado, where it's going to go, and sometimes you're, you get a knot in your stomach because you realize that tornado is heading towards a community. And then other times it'll skip right in and out of a heavy populated area. So it's kind of a roll of the dice. tornado unfortunately appears to be going through a populated area now. As a chaser, I never forget that that tornado's on the ground, and if you see debris go up or something else, you wonder, you know, is that is that someone dying there or someone's home being destroyed? It's it's a very uncomfortable feeling. It, one side of you is very excited because you're witnessing this amazing spectacle, and then the other side of you, there's a knot in your stomach saying, you know, people could be dying as you're watching this thing, and you, you have to remember that as a chaser. Tornado less than one mile away, large wedge on the ground. Got to stop here pretty brief. video shot of the year. I think lightning storms are probably one of the most dangerous storms to chase. With a tornadic storm, if there's a tornado on the ground, you can usually track it and stay away from it. It's your choice how close you want to get. With a hurricane, you know days in advance it's coming. You can watch television and radar reports. The problem with lightning is, is there's nothing you can do to really forecast it. Lightning makes up its own mind where it's going to hit. And it can be, you know, the top of your head or your tripod. That's what makes it so dangerous. It gives very few secrets of its intentions before it actually hits. You may feel your hair stand on end, or, or as happened to me one time, my, my tripod actually became electrified. It's not uncommon for lightning to leap out the back of a storm or the sides uh, maybe 10 or 15 miles away from the storm. That, that's not real common, but it does happen. So you have to remember, usually if you're close enough to a storm to hear thunder, or see the lightning, you're in danger. And of course, really, anytime you're near a storm of any kind, it's, it's dangerous. But especially if the storm's generating lightning, uh, it's, it's safe not to second guess it. I don't recommend anyone going out and trying to shoot lightning again unless you have the experience or you can do it in a manner that's, that's safe. Well, what I like about lightning is, is it's like a snowflake. No two lightning bolts are the same. I can go through my files and look at thousands of photographs, and although you have some photos that are similar, you never have the same lightning bolt. It's like a fingerprint where you'll have one little strange little curly branch here, or you'll have maybe a dual branch or several branches or a single branch. It's always different. That's what's so amazing about it. You just never know what you're going to capture on film. And sometimes when you're watching it, when you're shooting it, what comes out on film is entirely different. And it's, sometimes it's astonishing when you actually have the film in your hand after you've shot it. Some of the things you see can be, can be absolutely breathtaking. I think the best lightning photographs come at the end of the day, right before it gets dark, when you have what we call beauty light. And there's just a little bit of existing light left. And you're able to balance that light with the lightning, whether it's sunset or, or just a little touch of light on the city. To me, that is the best light for lightning. A lot of people will ask me, what's the secret to shooting lightning? And there really is no secret because the exposures, the, the, the film speed, the, the shutter openings, all these things can vary greatly because of uh, existing light or the, uh, the type of lightning and your, your proximity to it and uh, some other factors too. Whenever I go shoot lightning on one of the popular hilltops near Tucson, there's always hundreds of people. It's, it's like the fireworks show, and I think a lot of people like to watch lightning for that reason. It is kind of like nature's fireworks. I think people are fascinated by it. And what, what amazes me, even to this day, after shooting lightning for well over 10 years, is that you're capturing something that would otherwise be lost forever. You'll see a great lightning bolt hit in front of you, and if there's people watching, you'll hear all the oohs, ahs, oh, that's amazing, and you know, people lose their minds, and it's just it's so gorgeous. And I'm thinking, wow, I've got that on film. I have captured something, I've lived and bombed it on film. And I think there's something about that, and I don't really know how to put it in words, but there's something about capturing something that's so elusive, so fast, so powerful. And once you've got it on film, it's, it's there forever.
When I first started shooting lightning on video, one of the things I would do when I came home, a matter of fact, I would sometimes stay out shooting lightning till 11 or 12 at night, and I'd come in and stay up till 3 or 4 in the morning, going back over every single lightning bolt and slowing it down in slow motion and watching it. And sometimes you see amazing things. It was fascinating. When we first started chasing, we would either use rental cars or our own cars. And one of the cars we used was uh, Tom, my chase partner's old police sedan, which we called the Blues Brothers car. I remember one time we were chasing uh, near Lubbock, and the tires were so coated with mud they became like balloons caked with mud, and the, and the car wouldn't move. And finally, Tom had to get out with a butcher knife and, and literally slice the mud off the tires. And uh, at the same time, of course, we were being eaten alive by texas size uh, mosquitoes. That's the way it works. At the end of the 1992 chase season, I decided that I, f I would need some type of vehicle designed just for chasing. The rental cars, the personal cars just weren't working out. Uh, they were okay, but I needed something with four-wheel drive, I needed something with more room, and, and mainly something designed just for chasing, something to hold all the communications equipment, all the computers, uh, all the other electronic equipment that we were suddenly uh, beginning to, to use in our chasing endeavors. We, we needed a vehicle uh, made just for chasing, and that's when I decided to design the uh, Shadow Chaser. Right now we're working night and day. It's March 23rd to get the truck ready for storm chase season. We've got roughly a little less than a month before we have to be on the road. When I first started putting the Shadow Chase together, I thought, oh, this is going to be a cinch. We'll just throw us equipment in and That'll be it, we'll be chasing. Well, little did I know that all the equipment that went in had to be engineered into this truck. It had to be designed so it was easy to use, you could pull it out, it had to have backup, it had to have redundancy systems in case something failed, and it became a very complex engineering problem which took a lot longer than I had originally planned. Well, this is the interior of the Shadow Chaser, and all this equipment in here serves a specific function when we're chasing, and some of it's for safety reasons and some of it's for relaying information. One of the most important pieces of equipment we have on board is the weather computer here. And this little monitor allows us at the touch of a button to get almost any kind of weather data that we can also uh, get through a computer service, uh, such as temperature, uh, wind speeds, dew points, and those types of things as we're actually driving. In front here, we have a, a special bracket that's designed for a video camera that allows us to shoot hands-free out the front of the, uh, of the truck here as we're driving. This is connected to a monitor so we can monitor what the camera is seeing. We have three radios, and these serve two very important functions. One is for receiving information as we're driving near a storm, and also we can uh, transmit data to the National Weather Service or emergency management organizations. Uh, same thing with the cellular phone, which is probably the most important uh, piece of communications equipment, which allows us to buy modem and get uh, computer data through this laptop computer. So all of this equipment has a very specific function as we're, when we're chasing, and it's all designed uh, to make chasing both safe and also allows us to relay information. Chasing at night can be very hazardous. There's a few chasers that will go out at night, but I won't. Very, very large hill. On this particular night, there was a tornado warning for the metropolitan Amarillo area, a report of a tornado heading into the city. And I got the big idea of, of trying to drive through part of the storm to get into the city to see if I could maybe get a shot of this tornado illuminated by lightning. The well but after I was on the freeway for just a few minutes, the car started getting hit by hell, and I knew I was in trouble. I was afraid it was going to break the windshield. And you know, when I look back on it, I'm not so afraid of injury from the hell as much as I would be afraid of being out of a chase for a day. And I think sometimes that's a concern when people say, oh, are you frightened? Uh, hell yeah, I'm frightened of storms just like everyone else, but at the same time, I'm frightened of not being able to chase the next day. So a lot of times when I get near a hell storm or wind or anything that could damage the vehicle, uh, one of my concerns certainly is that, that we're able to chase the next day mechanically, in addition, of course, to our own personal safety.